So, in the next two lectures, uh, we will talk about uh, band structures of semiconductors and then the optical properties that go with these uh, band structures. So I have grouped the topics together for uh, lecture seven and eight. And uh, what I would like to do today is um, I will talk about band structure and direct and indirect uh, band gaps and transitions and then I will take some time to talk about various uh, computational techniques, various techniques that can be used to uh, calculate band structures and to understand these band structures. And especially I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, K.P theory. And then what we will do in the next uh, lecture is that we will talk about the interband transitions that can occur between uh, different uh, electronic states in the band structure and we will calculate the uh, absorption coefficients using Fermi's golden rules for direct and indirect band gaps and we will see different techniques to extract uh, the band structure from uh, plots of the absorption coefficients and we'll also talk about Van Hove singularities uh, that give us um, critical points in the dielectric function and um, uh, peaks in the, in the optical spectra. So today I think I will only talk about the band structure and I think that should fill uh, the hour or so that we have today and then um, the optical interband transitions I'll talk about next time. Uh, again, uh, the more basic materials in these next two lectures is taken from Mark Fox, uh, Optical Properties of Solids. But in this particular uh, lecture, I rely heavily on the book by Ewan Cardona, especially where the um, K.P method is uh, concerned. I'll refer a little bit to Ashcroft and Merman. And um, if you really have, uh, if you want to know the band structure for a particular semiconductor, then the book by uh, Cohen and Chelikowski is probably your best source. And um, also to look at uh, parameters such as effective masses, uh, uh, you can find a lot of information at the Joffe Institute website. Uh, so here's an outline. Again, we'll talk about uh, where does the band structure come from and it obviously it comes from Bloch's theorem. I'll give you uh, examples for semiconductors, for metals and complex oxides. And then we'll use uh, different methods to treat uh, band structures with increasing uh, levels of complexity. And then we will study in detail the effective masses that come out of the uh, K.P band structure calculations will look at the valence band warping and at the Luddinger parameters. So that's the uh, more details about today's topics. So band structure, where does the band structure come from? And I will give you uh, two different explanations and uh, this explanation is um, the mathematical explanation. So basically, um, the band structure just follows out of the math uh, the uh, crystals, uh, and I'm showing you here the uh, zinc blend structure. Crystals have, translational uh, crystals have translational symmetry and they have point group symmetry. And the translational symmetry results in Bloch's theorem. Um, the Translational symmetry is a cyclical group because we're dealing with uh, periodic boundary conditions. So if I translate the entire crystal by a, um, a primitive uh, lattice translation, then the crystal does not change. But instead of dealing with an infinite crystal, I have periodic boundary conditions so that I'm taking the, the an infinite crystal would be separated into blocks. So if I translate the crystal n times, then the atoms just wrap around and turn back into themselves. So the mathematical theorem is here that representations of cyclic groups are uh, one-dimensional. 
uh, that means that all uh, representations are trivial and these one-dimensional uh, representations are generated by primitive lattice vectors and the characters of these uh, cyclic groups are roots of unity. So the group is cyclic because we're dealing with periodic boundary condition and what is a root of unity? That is a root of unity. Uh, a root of unity is a number that I take to the nth potential and then I get one. So, for example, minus one is a root of unity because if I square it, I get one. I, the imaginary unit, is also a root, uh, uh, a root of unity because I to the fourth power is also one. So any uh, complex exponential that I can write like this is a root of unity because if I take, in, uh, if I take a reciprocal lattice vector for this uh, wave vector k, then e to the i g dot t, that is equal to 1. So the representations of a cyclic group are the roots, roots of unity, so I, I, uh, the translation operator acts on the uh, wave function. And how does the translation operator act? Well, it means that I need to shift the lattice, and here some people may say, well, it really shouldn't be r plus t, it should be r minus t. There are two different conventions here that are called active and passive. So I could also write it the other way, but I want this to be e to the plus i k dot t. That's why I'm writing plus t. So the translation operator acting on the wave function is a translation of the wave function by this translation vector t. And the translation operator acts on the wave function uh, through a representation which is one dimensional and the character is, the factor is a root of unity. So the translational vector uh, acting on the wave function is equal to this uh, complex exponential multiplied by the wave function. So that is just math that the translation is equal to a multiplication with this complex exponential. And then if I know that, then I can conclude that the uh, wave function must be equal to a, uh, to a plane wave multiplied by a wave function u, which is periodic in the crystal. You see this wave function psi here, that is not periodic in the crystal. That is not the same in every unit cell. But uh, this wave function u, that is the same in every unit cell. And to get the full wave function, I need to multiply with this complex exponential. So um, based on the representation theory for uh, one-dimensional cyclic groups, we get Bloch's theorem. And um, the translational uh, symmetry commutes with the Hamiltonian. And therefore, uh, both energy and wave vector are good quantum numbers. And therefore, I can classify the electronic states uh, by describing them by their energy and by their wave vector. So for each uh, wave vector k, we label the bands from lower to higher energies. And we're getting these uh, plots E n as a function of the wave vector for any k in the Brillouin zone. So from the uh, translational symmetry, a crystal is equal to a lattice plus a basis. So here is our crystal structure. And then the crystal structure gives us the Brillouin zone. And the crystal together with the Brillouin zone, we result in this band structure where this is the first band and this is the second band and these bands are three and four and this is number five, etc. So from the theory of representations of groups, that's how we get to the, um, that's how we get to the band structure. So some people say, I don't, stand, I don't understand a single word, there has to be a simpler explanation. So here is the uh, simpler explanation, which is a more chemical explanation, uh, that we start with an atom. And the typical example is we start with a carbon atom, but 
the carbon band structure, the diamond and silicon band structure are a little bit different. So even though I want you to think of carbon, uh, the atom that we really need to look at is a germanium. So you have two germanium atoms, and these germanium atoms will have um, S electrons and uh, P electrons. And here you can think of the hydrogen model uh, where you have um, S and P electrons. And um, for germanium, I have a total of uh, four electrons. So I have two S electrons and two P electrons. So the S states are all full, but uh, I have six P states where I'm only putting two electrons uh, for each atom. So now let's go from an atom to a molecule consisting of two germanium atoms. So I have uh, two wave functions, I have two atomic wave functions for the germanium, and then I can either form a bonding or an antibonding linear combination of those two wave functions. So the bonding combination is the sum of the two wave functions of the germanium atoms and the antibonding orbital is the difference of the uh, two atomic orbitals. And typically what will happen is that the bonding orbitals for both S and P will have a lower energy than the uh, anti-bonding orbitals, which are the anti-symmetric uh, combinations of those wave functions. And then um, I need a, so now for two atoms I have a total of eight electrons, so I'm putting two in the S-bonding orbital with spin up and spin down, and I'm putting six in the P-bonding orbital, each with spin up and spin down, so these states, the bonding states, are filled, and the antibonding states are unfilled. So that is for a molecule which has two germanium atoms. When I go from the molecule to the crystal, then these orbitals, which have discrete energies, these orbitals will broaden, and instead of having just a single energy, I have a range of energies. And um, these bands, so the orbitals broaden into bands because of the uh, interactions between uh, different atoms in the crystal. So I have these filled bands, which are called the valence band, and I have the unfilled bands, which are called the uh, conduction bands. Between the filled bands, between the valence band and the conduction band, there is a gap, which we call the band gap. And um, what is not shown in this picture, but what usually happens also, is that the broadening is so large that there will actually be an overlap between the S-bonding and P-bonding states. And here you see this, there is a continuous range of electronic states. This is the uh, S-bonding orbital. These three here, uh, these are the P-bonding orbitals and there is a continuous range of energies, and then up here we have the S and P uh, anti-bonding uh, valence band. So, that is a simpler picture for the uh, band structure, and here are some examples. Um, the argument that I've made is uh, the, the, as I said, the bands are broadened, so here I have the S antibonding band, and you can see that it uh, consists of a certain range. And uh, you might ask, well, why is it that the uh, bands broaden? Why do I have this broadening that takes us from a discrete state to a continuum of state, uh, of electronic states? And the, the answer has to do with um, kinetic energy. If I have a molecule consisting of two germanium atoms, then the electrons that belong to this molecule only have potential energy. They cannot move. You know, the, the, 
the, the germanium atom is sitting here, so the electrons also have to be here. The electrons cannot move around. So therefore, in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a molecule, you have discrete states. But when you go from the molecule to the crystal, then the electrons can move within the crystal. And therefore, the total energy in the crystal is a sum of a potential energy, which is of this molecular origin, plus a kinetic energy. So here, uh, what we are plotting, therefore, along this axis is the, the wave vector. That's the crystal momentum. And uh, gamma means that the electron has zero uh, kinetic energy. But if the electron gains more and more speed, then its energy increases. And uh, uh, the lambda direction is the 1, 1, 1 direction. Uh, so if the electron travels along the 1, 1, 1 direction, then it gains kinetic energy and therefore the total energy increases. And then the same is true along the delta direction, which is the 1, 0, 0 direction. So the electron sits here at the gamma point, has only potential energy, no kinetic energy, and then as the uh, momentum increases, the, uh, the, the total energy also increases because the kinetic energy increases. Uh, the third direction here is the sigma direction, and that is the 1, 1, 0 direction, which takes us from the gamma point to the uh, U and K uh, points in the Brillouin zone. So the total energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. The uh, potential energy is, is um, the momentum squared divided by two times the mass. Momentum equal to zero corresponds to the gamma point in the Brillouin zone. And uh, like I said earlier, we have uh, four valence electrons per atom. And we have uh, two atoms in the primitive unit cell for the diamond structure. So we have eight electrons per cell. So this band here holds two electrons, one with spin up and one with spin down. So we can put two electrons in this band here. And then here I have it looks like I have only two bands, but this band is doubly degenerate. I can see that more easily along the one zero, along the one one zero direction. I really have one, two, three bands. So there's three bands here, and I can put uh, six electrons in these uh, p-type states, the p-bonding states. So since I have eight electrons per cell, these four bands here will be filled. And therefore, I'm putting a zero here. The zero means the highest occupied state. Uh, the top of the valence band is usually uh, chosen as the energy reference level. So this is the top of the valence band, and uh, that is the highest occupied states. Uh, chemists would call that the highest occupied molecular orbital. And then, since this is silicon, the, in silicon, the S and P antibonding orbitals are reversed. So the P antibonding orbital in silicon has a lower energy than the S antibonding orbital. So this state here is the uh, S antibonding orbital. I'm sorry, that's the P antibonding orbital. And I have a gap between the uh, occupied valence band and the unoccupied uh, conduction band. Uh, this picture is taken from uh, the book uh, by you and Cardona, Fundamentals of Semiconductors. But the uh, source of this image is a 1976 paper by uh, Jim Chelikowski and Marvin Cohen. And, um, Gener uh, calculated using the empirical pseudopotential met method uh, with non-local corrections and spin-orbit corrections. And uh, there are many, many different ways of calculating uh, 
band structures, but typically those band structures will be most accurate that are derived from experimental input. So the empirical calculations, because they are fitted to experimental data, are usually more accurate than the uh, ab initial calculations, even though the ab initial calculations have been getting better and better. Uh, but they still have uh, significant difficulties and for some materials, uh, especially those with correlated electrons, DNF electrons, uh, um, they're still fitted to uh, experimental parameters. So uh, this is an empirical uh, calculation which uses a number of parameters that have been fitted to experiment. So this is silicon. And um, germanium is, uh, the valence band of germanium is uh, pretty much exactly the same as that of uh, silicon, except that uh, germanium has a higher Z, has a higher uh, a number of total electrons, and therefore the spin orbit splitting term L dot S, uh, that's this Pauli term which comes out of the Dirac equation. Uh, the spin orbit splitting in germanium is approximately 0 0.3 electron volts, much larger than in silicon, and therefore we are, uh, in, in this band structure calculation, uh, Chelikowski and Cohen included the uh, spin orbit splitting, and because uh, we are going from a uh, non-relativistic calculation to a relativistic calculation, uh, you see that also these, these labels, these, uh, these, group these group theoretical labels of the representations, they have changed. So this gamma 2, 5 prime state in uh, silicon, which is the single group notation, that is uh, the non-relativistic case, that is splitting into a gamma 7 plus and a gamma 8 plus state in germanium. But apart from this uh, relativistic correction for spin orbit splitting, the uh, band structure in, in the valence band structure in silicon and in germanium is, is uh, pretty much the same. And the other thing you see is that the S antibonding state, which in silicon is up here, that state has moved down. So the S antibonding state in germanium is lower than the P antibonding state in germanium. So that is uh, the first example for a band structure calculation that I, uh, for a band structure that I wanted to show you. Uh, the second example is uh, band structures can not only be calculated for insulators and semiconductors, we, uh, of course, we also have band structures for metals. And the example here on the left is aluminum, and on the right I have copper. So let's look at aluminum first. Um, we have three valence electrons in uh, aluminum, and uh, we have two S electrons and one P electron in the third, uh, in the third shell. There are no D electrons. And um, of course, the, uh, three band, the, the three P band is, is less than half full, so that's wrong uh, because I have uh, six electrons here. But I have, I have an odd number of electrons, so uh, I, because I have an odd number of electrons, this, uh, I can immediately conclude that uh, this must be a metal. And if you look at the band structure, then you see the same thing that you saw in germanium, that we have this band here, which sort of goes like a parabola. And I see the same here in aluminum, that I have this uh, parabola here, that um, at this energy level, I only have potential energy at the gamma point, because here at gamma, the momentum is zero. And then as I move away from gamma, the uh, momentum becomes non-zero, and therefore I add kinetic energy, and therefore I have this uh, shape, which is a parabola, so that is obviously the S state. And then I have other states which are uh, related to the P state, but the uh, P state is, is, is uh, only partially filled, and therefore, <coughs> 
um, there is no gap. So you see this, uh, I'm, I'm, filling, I'm using two electrons to fill up the uh, S shell and then I have another electron which goes into the uh, P shell, but obviously the P shell fits six electrons. So um, the, second, uh, the, third, the second P electron would go here, the third would go here. So um, I can fit a lot more electrons into this P shell and therefore there is no gap and the bands are filled up to here and uh, this, uh, these are the unfilled states. So here we don't really talk about a conduction band and a valence band because this band here is only partially filled. Copper is similar to, uh, to some extent. Um, the noble metals, copper, uh, silver and gold, we already talked about the noble metals, what makes them noble. Uh, they're called noble metals because the D bands are completely full. And the S and P electrons can move through the crystal, but the D bands, the D electrons are closer to the core and therefore the D electrons cannot usually move. They're bound to the atom that they belong to. At least that's true to, uh, uh, to first order. And because the D electrons, because the D electrons are, are bound, are strongly bound to their atom, they cannot move and therefore they cannot have kinetic energy. So the D electrons only have potential energy, no kinetic energy. The S bands are the opposite. You see this parabola here, this means that the S electrons have kinetic energy. So now when you look here, you see these spaghetti lines going across. These are the D bands. And the D bands are much less a parabola than the 4S band. So the 4S band is a sum of potential energy plus kinetic energy and therefore you get a parabola. The D bands only have or mostly have only uh, potential energy and uh, therefore the, you, you find these spaghetti lines that go across. So whenever you see these lines going across without any dispersion, without any kinetic energy, then they are usually D and F electrons. So this 4S band, this crosses the, uh, this 4S band crosses the uh, D bands. So it starts here and then it gets deflected, it interacts, it hybridizes with the D bands, but then if you get out of the range of the D bands, then this 4S band continues. And this 4S band can hold two electrons, but we're only putting one there. And therefore, the, uh, there is no gap and the uh, 4S band continues and therefore uh, copper is a metal. Obviously, we already knew that. And the second conclusion that we can draw from this band structure is that because the D bands are completely full, copper cannot be ferromagnetic because there are no unpaired spins. And if we have partially filled D and F electron states, then uh, uh, that can give rise to interesting uh, magnetic properties. Uh, the third example of a band structure I wanted to give you is uh, strontium titanate. And, um, well, it's a lot more complicated than uh, silicon. Why is that? Well, we have, uh, we have five atoms per unit cell. We have a lot of electrons in this system and therefore the uh, band structure is much more calcul is much more complicated. Uh, this band structure here was, uh, uh, is taken from uh, this paper for strontium titanate. Uh, this is a calculation that uses the local density approximation. And I will say a little bit more later about the local density approximation. Uh, if you're an experimentalist, then you should remember that 
the local density approximation usually gives you a very good description of the uh, valence bands, but it completely underestimates the band gap. If you want to get the band gap right, then you have to use uh, corrections for many body effects. Uh, so you need uh, the GW corrections. LDA is an acronym. It's an abbreviation that means local density approximation. Uh, GW is not an acronym. The G stands for Green's functions and the, the W is, is some interaction. So this is shorthand for some uh, equations, but it, it doesn't really stand for anything. So if you do these GW corrections, then at least for semiconductors without any DNF electrons, you get reasonable band structures. But even for, uh, uh, but for systems that have D electrons, uh, the GW corrections do not work so well. Um, and therefore people often introduce this uh, empirical parameter U. These uh, D electron states, they like to uh, hybridize into a lower and upper Hubbard band. And so the D electrons split, just like the uh, bonding and antibonding states split. And this Hubbard U parameter describes the splitting of the D electron bands. Uh, but this U is, is, I don't know if it can be calculated, but at least in those calculations that I've seen, this U is treated as a parameter and you just, uh, you adjust your band structure uh, for the splitting of the D electrons to until you get reasonable agreement with experiments. So that's the uh, band structure for uh, strontium titanate uh, calculated using the local density approximation. Here's the valence band and the valence band is mostly made up of oxygen uh, 2p states and we have a lot of oxygen uh, in this crystal. We have three oxygen atoms per uh, uh, for per unit cell and therefore uh, there are uh, six electrons that we need to put here so that explains why there's so many uh, so many atoms here so uh, so many orbitals here so these are the uh, uh, oxygen 2p states that make up the top of the valence band and then um, this is the lowest conduction band, which is formed by uh, titanium 3D states. Now remember, we have, we have 10 D orbitals, so five for each spin. A five-fold degeneracy is not allowed by group theory in a cubic crystal. Therefore, these five states must split into a triplet and a doublet. The triplet is called T and the doublet is called E. So the three D states of titanium are actually split and this is the lower state, that's the triplet, and then up here I have some higher lying titanium 3D orbitals uh, which are related, which are coming from this uh, doublet. And the strontium 4D states are even higher than the titanium 3D states. Um, there are two extrema in the valence band. One is at the gamma point, which has zero momentum, but there is another point in the Brillouin zone where the um, energy is about the same as the one at the gamma point. So this state, even though it does have kinetic energy, has the same energy, total energy, as this state here. So the potential energy varies and therefore the addition of kinetic energy does not give us uh, a different energy. So now I can make a direct transition where the K vector does not change and uh, that is shown here by the solid line, by the solid arrow. But I can also make transitions from this point in the valence band at R to this point in the conduction band at gamma. So in this transition, the uh, crystal momentum of the electron changes. 
And such a transition is called an indirect transition and is shown by the dashed line and we'll get back to these direct and indirect transitions uh, in the next lecture. So if you calculate, if you look at the band structure plot, then in some cases it's, it's very easy to see that this must be a D or F band and this must be an S band. And they all must be copper bands because copper is the only atom that I have. But when you look at a band structure like this, how would you know whether these are oxygen bands or titanium or strontium bands? And the way that you can do that is uh, that the theorists calculate the total density of states. So I'm taking the band structure and I'm integrating over the entire Brillouin zone. And now I'm getting something which is a number as a function of energy. And uh, so that gives me the uh, total density of states. And then say if the uh, band structure is derived from atomic orbitals, then I can project out uh, the wave function belonging to the different atomic sites. And that way I can divide the total density of states into a density of states belonging to the different atoms in the crystal. So what I see here is, this, so this is the uh, total density of states and the dashed line is the Fermi level. So the dashed line is the Fermi level. There are quite a few states be just below the Fermi level that makes up the top of the valence band. The top of the valence band, well there's very little strontium and very little titanium and most of these states just below the Fermi level are coming from the oxygen 2p orbital. So using this projected density of states, I can conclude that this band here comes from the oxygen 2p states. And then let's look on the other side of the, uh, just above the Fermi level, there's a little bit of oxygen, but most of the uh, density of states above the Fermi level, just above the band gap, comes from titanium 3D states. So that's why I labeled these states here as titanium 3D states. And then the strontium 4D states are even higher. So in order to assign this, uh, the, the various bands in the band structure to specific atoms, I need this uh, projected density of states which I'm getting from the calculations. Um, and here I'm showing you another example for the direct and indirect transitions. And these are two band structures for gallium arsenide and germanium taken from the uh, Joffe Institute website. And you see these are simplified band structures. So the full germanium band structure is this. But sometimes we just are interested in uh, the very top of the valence band and the very bottom of the conduction band and therefore, which, and, and also with mostly, we're often just interested in the center of the Brillouin zone, so we're plotting these bands uh, as a function, uh, we're plotting these bands just uh, near the center of the Brillouin zone and just the top of the valence band at the bottom of the conduction band. And then if we look at germanium, we see that the top of the valence band is at k equals zero at the gamma point, but the lowest conduction band minimum is actually at the L point. So if I want to make a transition between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band, then I have to make this indirect transition, which is shown here by the uh, dashed arrow. And I mentioned earlier that the valence band of germanium is split by the spin orbit interaction and that is blown up here and you, this energy here, that is the spin orbit splitting. In this graph it is called ESO, that's the spin orbit splitting. Uh, more often we might call it delta or delta zero.
Uh, that splits the j equal 3 half state from the j equal 1 half state uh, that belongs to this p orbital. So this band, that's the j equal 1 half state, we call that the split off band. And the j equal 3 half state that splits into one band which has less curvature and another band which has more curvature. And the band with the higher curvature, uh, sorry, the band with, the, uh, with less curvature, that's called the heavy hole. And this band here is called the light hole. And I will get back to that, uh, I will get back later to answer the question, uh, why are we calling them heavy and light? So in gallium arsenide, the uh, valence band of gallium arsenide is very similar to the valence band of uh, germanium. But in gallium arsenide, the minimum of the conduction band is at the uh, gamma point. And therefore, to make a transition from the highest valence band state to the lowest conduction band state, um, I do not need a difference in momentum. I can just make a vertical transition, which is called a direct transition, where the initial state and the final state have the same wave vector. Uh, the L value in gallium arsenide is approximately 300 milliEV above the uh, gamma point, and the X value is maybe 480 milliEV at uh, above gamma, if I remember correctly. So this band here is actually the lowest band in germanium, but in gallium arsenide it has moved up. And if we look at gallium antimonide, Shirley, if we look at gallium antimonide, then um, gallium antimonide is in between where the difference between the L valley and the gamma valley is only about 80 milli electron volts. So we have this sequence where in germanium we, we have the lowest state in the, uh, at the L point and then gallium antimonide is in between. In gallium arsenide the L valley is 300 milliEV higher and if we go to indium phosphide then the L valley has moved up uh, even more and that's why it is interesting to look at this transition from indium phosphide to gallium arsenide, gallium antimonide uh, to germanium to see how, the, uh, how this gradual change in the band structure affects the optical properties. So I told, you that I told you that I was going to talk more about the heavy and light holes. So the, the total energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. And the simplest possible approximation that we can make is, well, we'll just throw this potential energy away. We set the potential energy to zero. And then the Hamiltonian is just the kinetic part, which is P squared over 2M. P is H bar, square, is H bar K. So this uh, Hamiltonian is just a kinetic energy term. So we can do that, and that works very well but we pay a price. And the price we pay is that the mass that enters into this kinetic energy, that mass is not the free electron mass, the mass of the electron in vacuum. The mass that we need for our calculations is an effective mass. So the effective mass comes from the potential energy contribution to the total energy. And by ignoring the potential energy term, we introduce this uh, effective mass. So now let's look back to germanium or gallium arsenide, or pick your favorite, uh, uh, pick your favorite diamond uh, semiconductor or zinc-blend semiconductor. And then we have this conduction band, which is curved upward, and we have the uh, valence band, which is curved downward. And let's start with the uh, electronic energy, which is easier to explain. So the electronic energy is this constant EG, which is the band gap. 
And that's the residual from the potential energy. That's the constant part of that potential energy. And um, in addition, we have this kinetic energy term where the effective mass is in the denominator. And the effective mass for uh, the electron in germanium is approximately, what, 0 0.05, something like that. Um, if this effective mass was 1, then the band would be basically flat. So to see any kind of curvature on uh, this scale, I need a very small effective mass. And for germanium, the effective mass is only about 1 20th of the electron mass in vacuum. Um, the valence bands, they need to curve downward because they are between the band, uh, because they are at, at the bottom of the uh, band structure. If the valence bands were curving upward, then there would be no band gap. So the valence band have to curve downward. Because they curve downward, this is a parabola with a negative curvature, so I need this minus sign here. So the effective mass for, uh, for the effective mass in the valence band is negative. So not only is the magnitude of the mass different from the free electron mass, it even has the wrong sign. So we put this minus sign in front of it and then we have the uh, we write the effective mass as a uh, positive parameter. And uh, there are, uh, this is the J equal one half state, that's the split off hole, and then I have the uh, heavy hole, which is the, the J equal three half state. And there's two bands, one with a more curvature and one with less curvature. This band with less curvature is called the heavy hole because this mass parameter is larger. So the heavy hole mass is larger than the light hole mass, and that's why we call them heavy or light. It just has to do with the magnitude of the effective mass. Um, in this approximation, uh, we have ignored the potential energy. The Hamiltonian is simply a, a kinetic energy. The electrons can be treated as free particles. And therefore, the wave functions, the electronic wave functions, are simply plane waves. And that makes it very easy to do calculations in this approximation, because we don't need to worry about what is the actual uh, wave function. We don't need to do any band structure calculations. We can just do calculations with plane waves. Uh, this picture is simplified because the uh, valence bands are not spherical. Uh, if, we look, uh, if you look at the heavy hole mass here, then the heavy hole mass only depends on the magnitude of the wave vector in this approximation. Uh, it's, but in reality, the uh, heavy hole energy depends not only on the magnitude, but also on the direction of the wave vector. And therefore, the effective mass will be different uh, in different directions. So instead of just dealing with a single number, which we call the uh, heavy hole mass or light hole mass, we need to worry about an effective mass tensor. The effective mass is the second derivative of the energy with respect to k divided by h bar squared. So if I take this expression and I take the second derivative, divide out the h bar squared, then I'm getting 1 over the mass. So to generalize that, um, I need to take the, uh, the energy depends on direction, so I need to take the uh, second derivative uh, along different uh, coordinate axes of the wave vector, and that gives me this effective mass tensor, which we will get to later when we talk about Luddinger parameters and the warping of the valence band. So this is the uh, 
free electron approximation where we deal uh, sometimes it's also called the empty lattice approximation where the um, uh, potential energy is equal to zero. Another way to look at this uh, free electron approximation is that uh, we, ignore, uh, we, we ignore the Brillouin zone for a moment or we're saying that uh, we're dealing with an ex we're working in an extended zone scheme in the extended zone scheme, I have this large parabola which goes way beyond the uh, boundaries of the Brillouin zone. But then when I go from the extended zone scheme back to the reduced zone scheme, I have to remember that this uh, wave vector 2 pi over a, that's really the same wave vector as zero. So I need to fold back the bands so I need to go here to the boundary of the Brillouin zone and then I need to fold back. So that's shown by this uh, figure here where instead of having the parabola continue this way, it has been folded back and it continues back the other way. And um, now this, uh, these, these bands here almost look like a, a semiconductor band structure. Uh, because I see here that I have uh, this, uh, uh, this point here where, uh, there might, where we might conclude that we might be looking for a gap opening up. So um, go, we, we can get the, uh, we, can, we can learn a lot about the band structure by going from the extended zone scheme to the reduced zone scheme. So the problem with this simple picture is that this picture is purely one-dimensional. And uh, these Brillouin zones are anything but uh, simple one-dimensional uh, objects. And therefore, uh, we have to go to three dimensions. We have to include the complexity of the Brillouin zone, which we're getting in uh, crystal lattices which are uh, where we're dealing with conventional crystal lattices rather than with a simple cubic lattice for example. So there is a book by Jones, Theory of Brillouin Zones 1975 and that gives examples for a variety of different uh, empty lattice band structures depending on the uh, crystal structure and the Brillouin zone that we have. And here is an example from that book. Uh, of course, in addition to uh, having just one band here, if we go to a real material like germanium, then I have not only the S states, I also have the P states to worry about. So this is the empty lattice band structure for a solid, where for in the empty lattice approximation, along the 1, 1, 1 direction. So this is where the parabola starts and then the parabola gets folded back. And then, uh, so that is the S state and then here it gets folded back again. So that is the S band, but in addition I also have P and D states and um, they are labeled here by their uh, group theoretical notations. So this picture here is the three-dimensional generalization of the one-dimensional picture that we had uh, earlier. And um, uh, in Jones you only find the 1, 1, 1 direction. In Cardona's book you find not only the uh, 1, 1, 1 direction, you also find the 1, 0, 0 direction, uh, both in the diamond structure and in the zinc blend structure. And um, together with the uh, group theoretical notations for these semiconductors. Uh, so that is for FCC, well what if you have a crystal which is uh, not FCC, what if you have BCC or HCP crystals? Uh, in Wikipedia you see uh, empty lattice band structures also for uh, other types of crystals and all of that uh, can be calculated within the approximation that the, uh, potential, that the potential energy is zero.
But now what we want to do is, uh, well, obviously this band structure is not what germanium looks like. So we have to find a way to turn on the potential and we want to do that gradually in order to understand what happens. So the first approximation that we can do is we can say, well, this potential energy, we know that it is not zero, but let's just assume that the potential energy is very small. And if the potential energy is very small, then we can treat it in perturbation theory. Which means that we, we first solve the uh, problem with the potential energy equal to zero, and then we add the potential as a perturbation using quantum mechanical perturbation theory. If you remember quantum mechanical perturbation theory, there are two different cases. There's a degenerate case and a non-degenerate case, and the degenerate case is much more difficult to solve than the uh, non-degenerate case. So we can first start with the non-degenerate states, and then if we treat the uh, non-degenerate state, then we find that uh, in first order there is uh, no correction to the energy, so we have to go to second order in perturbation theory uh, to get corrections. So the energy at a point K is equal to the free electron uh, unperturbed energy plus something that goes like the, uh, that goes to second order in the potential. And uh, the first thing we might say, well, non-degenerate states do not shift much because the correction is second order. But the other thing we see is that we have this sum over all bands, we have this sum over all uh, reciprocal lattice vectors k, and depending on whether <coughs> this energy here is smaller or larger than the unperturbed energy, this term here can either be positive or negative. And the bands that are below the unperturbed energy, they will give a positive contribution. So the bands that are below the unperturbed energy will tend to shift it up. But the bands that are higher in energy than the unperturbed energy, they will push it down. So uh, the way that this is described, the way that the signs of different bands in this sum is described is we say that the bands repel each other. So the same, the bands below it, they push us up, the bands above us, they push us down. So there's this repulsion of bands and that's why it's important to look at the energy denominator. Um, for the uh, degenerate states, the uh, equation is more difficult and that's why I did not write it down. But uh, what I want to tell you is that the small perturbation lifts degeneracy and gaps open, especially at the boundary of the Brillouin zone, and the magnitude of the gap is roughly twice the uh, Fourier coefficient that from the um, atomic potential that we have added here. So degeneracies are lifted. These two bands used to be degenerate, but the degeneracy is lifted by the perturbation and a gap opens up. And now this gap here is to first order in the potential. So the first order effects of the uh, weak potential energy are only seen at the boundaries of the Brillouin zone where there are degeneracies. We do not see that uh, in the center of the Brillouin zone. And uh, that is described in more detail in, in chapter 9 of Ashcroft and Merman. Uh, and that's standard content of uh, lectures on solid state physics. So previously I showed you how we went from the uh, free electron approximation to the empty lattice. But here at the empty lattice, we still have the degeneracies at the uh, boundaries of the Brillouin zone. Uh, 
But now when we go to the uh, nearly free electron gas where there are where there is a weak potential, then this parabola in the extended zone scheme, whenever we are uh, at the boundary of the Brillouin zone or at a multiple thereof, we see that these gaps open up. So now instead of having instead of having this type of a band structure, the band structure now looks like this, where we have the gaps at the Brillouin zone. We also have the gaps uh, uh, that were opened in the center of the Brillouin zone uh, that came from the, uh, from the weak potential. So there's a number of things that a potential does. The first one is it lifts degeneracies and opens gaps. But the other thing we see is that the bands are uh, that the repulsion between the bands means that at the zone boundary or also at other high symmetry points the uh, bands are flat and we find extrema in the band structure at high symmetry points and at the boundary of the Brillouin zone. So here the, uh, the slope of this um, band is zero and uh, there is a local maximum here in the energy at this uh, point on the boundary of the Brillouin zone. So that was a weak potential. Uh, what if the potential is not weak? How do, what are the methods that we have in order to treat uh, actual crystal potentials? So the problem with the crystal potential is that it is a Coulomb potential and the Coulomb potential diverges for r equal to zero. That's shown by the dashed dotted line here. But the good news is that the electrons that are out here, they don't really see the nucleus because there are core electrons that are between the valence electrons and the nucleus and these core electrons, they screen the atomic potential uh, from the nucleus. So instead of having this diverging Coulomb potential, we have uh, a, the, the electron out here sees a different type of potential where we have to take into account the screening by the electrons uh, that are near the core. So instead of having this hard uh, diverging Coulomb potential, the actual potential that we need to use in calculations is this uh, screened uh, pseudo potential and uh, people usually uh, reply to, uh, refer to this as soft core pseudo potentials. Uh, some people deal with ultra soft uh, pseudo potentials. So the softness here simply means that the divergence at the core has been screened by the core electrons. So here is the potential in real space. Uh, we uh, Fourier transform this and we need the potential. Uh, here we get the potential in uh, reciprocal space. And uh, this screened Coulomb potential then takes uh, 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 such a shape here where the value for Q equal to zero uh, we typically choose minus two-thirds of the Fermi level for the related metal. Uh, that is the value of the pseudopotential and then it, as the wave vector increases, the potential decreases, gets closer to zero. So it is negative in this region and then it overshoots a little bit, is positive, and then we don't really care what happens uh, for larger values. To do an actual calculation, the interesting thing is we only need to know the potential at these three points. So with three numbers, we can describe the entire potential because only these three numbers show up as um, Fourier coefficients and these three values of Q uh, these three values of Q correspond to three specific lengths of the reciprocal lattice vectors which are coming into play for the specific crystal that we have chosen. 
So we only need to know three, or maybe there's another one, a fourth one that one might use, depending on the number of uh, uh, plane waves that one uses. But for 59 plane waves, to diagonalize a 59 by 59 uh, matrix, uh, these three numbers are sufficient um, So what we do in the empirical pseudopotential method is that we guess these three numbers and then you know we, we draw this line through these three numbers. Uh, we, the fourth number you might say as a constraint is the uh, two th minus two thirds of the Fermi level. So we're guessing these three numbers for the potential and then the uh, potential energy can be written as a Fourier transform of the uh, potential in reciprocal space. So with these three numbers, uh, we can calculate the uh, crystal potential. And then we write down the Schrodinger equation. And solving the Schrodinger equation means that we need to diagonalize this 59 by 59 matrix. And then we're getting wave functions and we're getting energies. And then the energies that we're getting, we are comparing them with ellipsometry spectra. Uh, here it says reflectivity, but today we do that with ellipsometry because that is more accurate. So we're comparing these energies with the uh, ellipsometry spectra and with other experiments. And then um, we see how close we are getting with the, uh, with the uh, parameters that we have chosen for the crystal potential. And um, in the early days, uh, in the 60s and 70s, people would adjust these parameters by hand, but nowadays we have the Marquardt Levenberg algorithm and very powerful computers so we can actually feed our experiments with the energies from experiments uh, with, uh, we can feed, we can, uh, our experiments will give us the energies of many, many bands at the high symmetry points in the Brillouin zone. And then we can just use the Marquardt Levenberg algorithm to minimize the, uh, these potentials to get the best agreement with experiments. So we, we alter these uh, three numbers for the Fourier coefficients of the potential energy until we get good agreement between theory and experiment. And then we are getting uh, the complete band structures uh, such as this one uh, for silicon. And you will see here that there are uh, dashed lines and solid lines in this band structure and the dashed line is really the one that you would be getting with uh, the method that I just described. Uh, there are non-local corrections in the solid lines and I will tell you later about uh, what those non-local corrections are. So that is the uh, empirical pseudo-potential method which works very well uh, it's a single electron equation, you see that here. There are no uh, multi-electron uh, terms here. There is no Coulomb repulsion. There's nothing in there for the Pauli exclusion principle. And that's why it is so simple. But nevertheless, it gives us uh, relatively good agreement with the experiment because we use experiment to adjust the crystal potential. Um, the self-consistent pseudo-potential method does not use experimental input and that's why it is called self-consistent. So we start with an atomic orbital. So instead of guessing something, we start, we, we start with um, atomic potential energies. And then we solve the Schrodinger equation for this uh, atomic potential. And then uh, because we calculate the, uh, because we have solved the Schrodinger equation, we're getting a wave function. And from the wave function, we can calculate the charge density. And now that we have the charge density, we can use, uh, we can uh, calculate corrections um, due to electron-electron uh, interactions and because of the Pauli principle.
And the first corrections that we're making is that we're saying, well, I need to add this Hartree energy to my atomic energy. And the Hartree energy describes the Coulomb repulsion between uh, different electrons. So instead of having an electron move in the bare potential of the atom, the electron also sees an effective electric field from all the other electrons in the atom. So that's the Hartree potential, and we can calculate that because we know the density. But that's only the Hartree energy, that's only the Coulomb repulsion. There's other terms, such as the Pauli exclusion, and they're usually uh, referred to as exchange correlation uh, potentials. And this exchange correlation is written as a functional of the density, and um, maybe I should have blown it up a bit more because it's hard to see, but the, um, the, potent the, the exchange correlation energy is some functional of the density. And you see that this functional only contains the density. So that the, the, the functional, the, the potential energy at R only contains the value of that uh, density at R, and that's why we would call that local. And also it only contains the density itself, it does not contain any derivatives of the density. So nowadays what people do is they include also some non-local corrections. Uh, there's something, a, a GGA, which I think is generalized gradient approximation, where instead of making this functional depend only on the density itself, it can only depend on, it can also depend on the derivative, on the gradient of the density. So now we're putting all this together and we are, we are taking the sum of the uh, we are taking the sum of the atomic potential, the Hartree potential, and the exchange correlation, and that gives us a new potential. And we're taking this new potential and we're putting it back into the Schrodinger equation and we're solving this again. And then we do this process iteratively until there is no more any change in the energies. So that is a uh, self-consistent method to calculate uh, band structures using uh, pseudopotential uh, wave functions. Pseudopotential means that, why is it called pseudopotential? Well, this is the actual potential, but I'm replacing the actual potential with a pseudopotential, which is different from the actual potential, but it gives me the same energies as the real potential would give me. And uh, with this pseudo-potential method, because I'm working in uh, Fourier space, I'm expanding the wave functions into plane waves, so I use a plane wave basis set. And with the empirical pseudo-potential method, I might use 59 or 89, uh, whereas with the self-consistent uh, LDA methods, pe people typically use hundreds of uh, plane waves in their expansions. Yes? Um, I do not understand what kind of experiment can be uh, useful to compare with uh, this um, uh, sort of potential. I, I don't get the correlation between experiment and uh, maybe it's what you explained with these 59 terms, but maybe I, I didn't get correctly. Um, experiment tells you nothing about the actual potential. With the experiment, you measure energies, okay. right? With the exp so you can do a photo emission experiment where you map out the band structure or you can do a, uh, an ellipsometry experiment where you measure band gaps and peaks in the uh, dielectric function. So these are the experimental parameters that give you information about the E of K. So the E of K is the experimental input and you adjust the pseudo-potential parameters until it gives you the right experimental, it gives you the right energies that can be measured with the experiment. Yeah? So, um, using this empirical pseudo-potential method, uh, 
Uh, we can calculate the band structures, and here again I'm showing you germanium and I'm showing you gallium arsenide calculated by Chelikowski and Cohen. And uh, there is, so what we see here is that uh, there's definitely gaps at the boundaries of the Brillouin zone. There are splittings, the crystal potentials opens up a band gap for germanium and for uh, gallium arsenide. And we also see that the bands are flat. The slope of the bands is zero at the edges of the Brillouin zone. This is exactly what we would have expected from the uh, perturbation with a small crystal potential. Um, I want to point out one detail here. Uh, there is uh, there are two important differences between the band structure of germanium and gallium arsenide and these two differences have to do with the fact that germanium has inversion symmetry but gallium arsenide does not have inversion symmetry because the gallium and the arsenic atoms are different so we lose the symmetry we lose the inversion symmetry because of the inversion symmetry the space group for germanium is non-symorphic we have non-primitive translations and therefore entire papers have been written about the nature of the bands at the X point. The uh, inversion symmetry with the non-symorphic space group demands that all electronic and all vibrational states at the X point must be doubly degenerate. So you see here in germanium doubly degenerate, doubly degenerate, doubly degenerate. When we go from uh, germanium to gallium arsenide, we see that a gap opens up. The gap here is relatively large, the gap here is small, and the gap here is also small. Uh, so in gallium arsenide, we have gaps at the X point, which we would not have in germanium. Uh, the other difference between gallium arsenide and germanium is shown here inside this blue circle. Uh, here in germanium the bands cross and this is something that looks like a Dirac point because I have a linear crossing of two bands. But this crossing does not occur in gallium arsenide and instead of crossing these two bands repel each other. So the repulsion is something that I've uh, mentioned earlier when we talked about this expansion with the energy denominators. So why is it that the bands cross for germanium but not for gallium arsenide? And uh, the difference, uh, the reason is that uh, in germanium these two bands here have different, uh, have different symmetries. These two bands belong these bands along the delta direction, these two bands belong to different irreducible representations. And because they belong to different representations, this matrix element here has to be zero because the wave functions are not compatible. So if you take a matrix element, uh, if you calculate an integral with a with an odd function multiplied by an even function, if you multiply, if you calculate an integral of such a product, then that integral has to be zero. So here in germanium, one of these two states is odd and the other one is even, and therefore they cannot interact with each other and they cross rather than uh, repel each other. So one is odd, one is even. For gallium arsenide, odd and even has no meaning because the crystal has no inversion symmetry. And therefore the bands cross for gallium arsenide while they, I'm sorry, therefore the bands repel each other for gallium arsenide while they cross each other for germanium. So um, we've talked about the free electron gas, we've talked about nearly free uh, band structures where the potential was small and then we looked at actual band structures uh, where the potential was expanded uh, into a pseudopotential with a small number of coefficients. I now want to talk about another method 
uh, which is called uh, k.p theory. And you cannot really do this ab initio, but it is more of a perturbation theory, where k.p is added as a perturbation to the free electron uh, energies and you need, you heavily rely on experimental input, but if you have experimental input then uh, the method can be extremely accurate. So how do I explain what k dot p theory is? So we start with the Schrodinger equation where the Hamiltonian has a kinetic energy part and a potential energy part and we have a wave function. Now this wave function is not periodic in the crystal, but instead using Bloch's theorem, the wave function can be written as a periodic part multiplied by this uh, plane wave term. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking this wave function and I'm plugging it in here. So I take p squared over 2m plus v applied to this product. Now V, I simply multiply V with this and there's not really a problem, but the P, remember the P is the momentum operator in quantum mechanics, so that is a gradient. So I'm taking the second derivative of this product. So I need to use the product rule for calculating the second derivative of a product of two functions. And the second derivative of a product of two functions is, uh, there's an error here, uh, so I take the second derivative of the first function and I multiply it by the second, and I take, that's this term where the g is missing, and then I take the second derivative of the function g and I multiply it with the first function, but then I also have this uh, term 2 f prime g prime, so there is this mixed term with the first derivatives of the, uh, of the product of the two functions. So if I apply this product rule to the, grade, to the square of the gradient operator and I plug this function in this, this block uh, wave function into here, then you see that that's the that's the, one deriv the second derivative of the first function, that's the second derivative of the other function, because if I, ap if I apply the uh, gradient on the uh, uh, complex exponential, that simply gives me a factor k, and then I have this mixed term where one derivative is still there and the other derivative has been applied to the plane wave, and the factor of 2, there used to be a 2 here, which cancels the 2 in the denominator. So this term is that mixed term. So by applying the product rule and by plugging in the block wave function into this, I'm getting this equation here. And I solve this equation for k equal to 0, and those are the brown terms and I use experimental input in order to get the, uh, I use experimental input like an experimental bank gap to get the energies at k equals zero and then these red terms, they are small as long as k is small and therefore because k is small I can uh, treat the red terms in perturbation theory and uh, that gives me very, very good uh, band structures for small values of k. It is also possible uh, to do full zone uh, k dot p theory, but um, I will not uh, get into that. I mostly want to use uh, k dot p theory to describe the band structure very close to the gamma point in the Brillouin zone. So that's the equation that uh, we want to solve. Um, we already know that at the edge of the Brillouin zone, at high symmetry points and at the center of the Brillouin zone, we usually find either maxima or minima and therefore uh, 
the first order perturbation theory terms, which would be linear in K, uh, they vanish because I'm at, a, at an extremum. And therefore, what I need to do in perturbation theory is that I need to treat this term, the K squared term, to uh, first order in perturbation theory. And the K dot P term, I need to treat that in uh, second order uh, perturbation theory. And um, I'm uh, using perturbation theory. I calculate the uh, corrections to the wave function, which are to first order. And then I'm calculating the corrections to the energy, which are to second order. And um, this h bar square k, uh, this, this term here, uh, that is trivial and that just gives me the uh, regular, uh, the expected part for the kinetic energy of a free electron in vacuum. And then using the perturbed wave function, I'm getting this second order correction uh, in, in second order perturbation theory. So, the energy at a point K, which is not too far from the gamma point, is equal to the unperturbed energy plus this trivial kinetic energy correction plus a second correction which takes into account the uh, K dot P matrix element between uh, other states in the Brillouin zone. And the number of matrix elements that I need are very small and yet I can get a very good descriptions for the wave function. So you see this correction here, these k dot p matrix elements that give me the correction to the effect, that give me the uh, corrections to the mass because that whole thing, I want to write that as a parabola. So this effective mass is equal to 1 over the effective mass is equal to 1 over the uh, free electron mass in vacuum plus something that comes from this matrix element. So what we see here in this formula, in, in this uh, description, is that the corrections to the effective mass that makes it deviate from the free electron mass, this correction comes from the interactions uh, between different bands via this uh, k dot p matrix element. So that is the nature of uh, the k dot p theory and now we would like to apply this uh, to a number of different uh, scenarios and the first application that we want to use is we apply this k dot p theory to the bottom of the uh, bands in germanium, to the bottom of the conduction band in germanium or silicon. So we need to evaluate this. We have this denominator here, we have this energy denominator here. And the largest term, unless the matrix element is zero, the largest term in this sum will, the, will be the term with the smallest energy denominator. The smallest energy denominator is equal to the band gap. So what we need is we need to calculate the k dot p matrix element between this band in the, the, gamma, the gamma band, uh, the conduction band at gamma with the valence band at gamma. That will be our uh, matrix element. And uh, this is a p state. So this p state has uh, wave functions x, y, and z. Uh, similar as to atomic orbitals and we need to calculate this matrix element uh, between this k dot p matrix element between x and gamma. I will show you uh, in the next lecture uh, how the, p, how the uh, k dot last, the, the k is something that can be taken out of that and I'll show you that in the next lecture. So here we're just saying that uh, this matrix element is a momentum matrix element and we just call that P and this matrix element has this uh, spherical symmetry because of the uh, point group symmetry of the crystal. So this matrix element P, 
um, it's easier to write the uh, kinetic energy associated with this momentum matrix element. Uh, this matrix element EP, that is approximately equal to 20 electron volts for most uh, conventional semiconductors. It does not vary much. And now uh, we've reduced this sum to the leading term and then the effective electron mass is one, of the f is one over the free electron mass plus this remaining uh, term from perturbation theory which is equal to 2p squared over the uh, free electron mass squared and the bank gap. And here you see that the K got cancelled out. And um, this second term here is usually much larger than the first term. So one over the, one over the effective electron mass is equal to this term. And therefore you see that the, that the matrix element is constant, the free electron mass is constant. So basically the electron mass is proportional to the band gap. The electron mass uh, in the conduction band is proportional to the band gap. And here is a variety of uh, semiconductors that are listed with band gaps that go anywhere from 0.9 electron volts for germanium to 3.8 electron volts for zinc sulfide or zinc selenide. And then uh, there is pretty good agreement between the uh, calculated and uh, between the calculated and experimental electron masses. So uh, with one number, with well, with two numbers, with two numbers, the uh, momentum matrix element which is independent of the material and the band gap, with these two numbers we can calculate what the, elect what the conduction band electron mass should be and it gives us really good agreement using uh, k.p theory by only retaining the first term in, the, uh, in that expansion. If you want to be more accurate, then you can include more terms and uh, this would be called a 4x4 four four k.p theory. There's also 16x16 16 16 k.p theories where you include more and more of these uh, numbers but remember, this method goes back to the 1950s where people didn't have computers. Uh, ca uh, diagonalizing a 16 by 16 matrix uh, was very difficult. And therefore, it is astonishing that with just two numbers, I can predict the electron mass and get good agreement. So that was an application to the uh, electron mass. Now, of course, you want to look at the valence band using the same technique. And before we can do that, we have to look more into the uh, wave functions, the, the atomic wave functions for the uh, valence band. The valence band is a P state. So I have three different, I have three different orbitals, X, Y, and Z. And um, for a, for an, L equal one state for a P state, I can have three different values of the magnetic quantum number ML, and this ML can be zero or plus one or minus one, and then rather than using X, Y, and Z as my wave functions, I use these uh, ladder combinations X plus IY and X minus IY, and if you've had uh, lectures in quantum mechanics, then you have seen this. And now uh, this is um, for the valence band maximum gamma 2 5 prime uh, where we ignore spin orbit interactions but now I need to include the spin and uh, for an electron the spin is equal to one half and the total angular momentum is equal to the angular momentum plus the spin and the way that I add these momenta is that L is equal to 1, so the total angular momentum is 1 plus minus 1 half. So that gives, me, uh, put, that gives me total angular momentum quantum numbers of 1 half and 3 half. Uh, 
So this L equal to one half state splits into a J equal three half state and a J equal one half state. And the difference between these two energies, we call that the spin orbit splitting delta zero. And in order to apply, in order to apply um, the uh, K dot P theory to the valence band, uh, we already know this matrix element P, which connects the P bonding state with the S antibonding state. But that matrix element alone is insufficient to explain the structure of the uh, valence band in germanium. So instead what we need to do is, you see this is the P bonding band and that's the S antibonding band. But we need to include one additional term in the sum. That is the largest term in the sum. We also need to include the P antibonding band. So now instead of using just one term in the expansion, we use two terms. So we need to include a matrix element here between, the, uh, between this P bonding band and the P antibonding band. And then of course there's also this matrix element between the S antibonding and the P antibonding ba band. So The matrix element Q describes the momentum matrix element connecting the XYZ wave functions in the valence band with the XYZ valence with the XYZ wave functions in the conduction band. So this matrix element Q connects the P bonding and the P antibonding orbitals. And the, uh, because of the cubic symmetry, because of the cubic symmetry, um, all of the matrix elements that we can form here, they're either zero or they are equal to Q. So with just two numbers, I can form this uh, 14 by 14 matrix, which includes the P bonding, the S bonding, uh, the S antibonding and the P antibonding uh, orbitals. And uh, I'm probably ignoring this matrix element here, but that can be included in, in, in higher order uh, corrections. So I'm just using two orbitals. I'm just using two matrix elements, P and Q. And then I apply the same uh, formula, the same perturbation formula. Uh, where I'm writing the matrix elements uh, P squared and Q squared and these two matrix elements give me the spin orbit mass which is the mass of this band here and um, here I'm taking into account the band gap E0 and the band gap E0 prime which is the difference between the P bonding and P antibonding bands and of course the spin orbit splitting delta zero because I'm calculating the um, split off mass band, uh, the mass of the split off band. Well more interesting should be the masses of the heavy and light hole bands and um, using these matrix elements P and Q I am defining three parameters A, B and C and these three parameters are called the inverse effective mass parameters. So these A, B and C squared they are some uh, combinations of P squared and Q squared and then I need, to s I need to diagonalize the matrix and this matrix was uh, first uh, solved by Dresselhaus, Kipp and Kittel, 1955. So this paper really started uh, K dot P theory. And if I uh, use these uh, inverse effective mass parameters, then I can see that the um, energy of the light hole and heavy hole bands, 
is equal to some term which goes like k squared and that is a spherically symmetric term plus or minus the square root of another spherically symmetric term but then you see this parameter c squared which is related to the matrix element q squared so the interaction between the p bonding and the p antibonding orbitals that gives me this non-spherical term where I have mixed terms like kx squared times ky squared. So that is the uh, warping term and because of this the bands are warped and on the next slide I will show you uh, what the warping actually looks like. Um, if I want to ignore the warping then I can do a spherical average and using the spherical average, I can calculate what the uh, average ma heavy and light hole masses would look like based on these parameters A, B, and C. Instead of seeing these uh, dresselhaus kipketel parameters A, B, C, sometimes you also see the Luttinger parameters, gamma 1, gamma 2, that's another typo, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. Uh, but you see that these parameters are just another way to express uh, the inverse effective uh, mass parameters. Here uh, in, uh, in the table in U and Cardona you see the parameters A, B and C squared listed for a variety of semiconductors along with the uh, spin orbit splitting for these materials and you see that the spin orbit splitting is very large in antimonides and very small in light materials like silicon or carbon and then using these parameters a b and c squared the uh, heavy hole and light hole and split off hole parameters were calculated and uh, compared with experiments and you see that it works quite well for the split off mass it also works well for the uh, light hole mass but getting the uh, getting the heavy hole masses is much harder and uh, the reason is that uh, this equation which is a spherical average this equation is actually wrong in uh, Cardona's book and I think that it's what it's supposed to be but even this uh, spherical average uh, makes certain assumptions and it's, it's not so easy to do this uh, spherical average so if the correct spherical average was taken then perhaps a better agreement with the experiment could be achieved. So I promised you some pictures and um, the first picture, so basically warping means that because of this non-spherical term the effective mass depends on the direction. The curvature defend depends on the direction in the uh, Brillouin zone. The heavy hole mass is larger than the average mass along 111 and the heavy hole mass is smaller along 100 and this is, the, uh, this is a calculation where uh, the black line is the spherically averaged heavy hole energy versus K and the blue line is the energy along 100 you see along 100 the curvature is larger and therefore along 00 the mass is smaller and the green line is 111 and there is uh, less curvature and therefore the mass is larger for the heavy hole mass along the 111 direction. If we're looking at the light hole then it's the exact opposite and if we look at constant energy surfaces then for the light hole we're getting this black uh, line which is almost a circle so the warping is not very strong for the light hole but for the heavy hole we're getting something which is really not a circle and that means that um, uh, these constant energy surfaces are very warped 
And a spherical average uh, may not be a good approximation for, uh, uh, for all experiments. And now you'll also see why, uh, why I introduced this uh, effective mass tensor, which is the uh, second derivative of the energy with respect to Ki and Kj. Um, this warping term here will make this effective mass tensor rather interesting. And uh, for some experiments, it may be necessary to take that into account. And um, I should say that the anisotropy and this warping of the valence bands was also described in, this, uh, in the experimental part of this paper by uh, Dresselhaus, Kipp, and Kittel, where using cyclotron resonance, where you are looking for microwave resonances in a magnetic field, uh, you are determining the effective masses. So, now I hope that after uh, explaining band structures, uh, you can, uh, if you see these pictures for gallium arsenide and germanium, then you can remember some of the story about what goes into these uh, valence span, uh, what goes into these band structures for semiconductors. You will appreciate that there is a band gap, there are separations between different satellite valleys. Some semiconductors like gallium arsenide are uh, direct, whereas other semiconductors like germanium are indirect. In germanium, the minimum is at the uh, L point. In, uh, Silicon, the minimum would be uh, somewhere at 85% uh, out to the X point. And um, if we are looking at wurzite semiconductors such as gallium nitride, aluminum nitride, silicon carbide, etc., then uh, they are no longer cubic and therefore we see an additional splitting uh, between the heavy and light holes, which comes from the reduced symmetry in the hexagonal uh, wurzite structure compared to the um, cubic structure. So um, that is all that I wanted to talk today. We'll uh, cover the uh, rest of the slides in two weeks, Mareike, is that right? So we talked today about how the band structure is derived from uh, Bloch's theorem. I gave you examples for different uh, types of materials for their uh, band structures. And um, we treated uh, band structures with various approximations, including uh, setting the potential equal to zero in the free electron approximation. Uh, treating the potential in perturbation theory with a nearly free electron gas. Uh, we've talked about uh, plane wave expansions of the wave functions and the related uh, pseudopotential methods. And then finally, we used the K dot P theory to describe effective masses and warping of the valence band. And now next time we start with uh, Fermi's golden rule and the Einstein parameters and we uh, study optical transitions in um, that are coming. We, we're talking about optical transitions within the band structure and that's why I needed to go over the band structure so that the uh, transitions make more sense. So thank you very much and I can take a few more questions. Yes. There's a third question. Uh, could you show please slide number eight? And uh, my question is uh, why uh, on the picture, so on that slide, it's different energies for metals. For example, uh, in, from, uh, on the left side, it's around 12 electron volts, and uh, from the right side, uh, you started from zero. So. And I was thinking about that too as, as we looked at that slide. So both of the, uh, so the question has to do with the energy scale. And um, 
if for aluminum, the energy, the zero energy is chosen to be the lowest energy in the aluminum 3S band. But in copper, the zero energy is chosen to be that of the Fermi level. So you may remember that potential energy is only defined up to a constant. So I can shift this any way I want to and I can add or subtract any number. And for a metal, it is more conventional to use zero. Uh, the, most, the, most commonly, the most common convention is to use zero EV as the highest occupied state at zero temperature. And for copper, that would be the Fermi level. For germanium, that would be the top of the valence band. But in this case, the uh, people that drew this band structure did not use that convention. And instead, in their case, the uh, Fermi level is at maybe 11 electron volts. And the zero energy reference level is where the 3S band of aluminum has zero energy. So it is just convention. Other questions? And another yes, question, yes. sometimes you use uh, like uh, spherical, but it's parabolical uh, if we can see uh, the dependence energy from uh, wave vector. It's why is okay, so, so the question is about the use of the term spherical and parabolic. Yes? So if we go to the if we ignore the potential energy, then the total energy is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. So that means two things. The first one is that the total energy, which is really just a kinetic energy, the total energy is quadratic in crystal momentum. That's what we mean by parabolic bands. So parabolic means the energy is quadratic in crystal potential. But in this case, the energy is not only parabolic, the energy is also spherical. Because the energy does not depend on the direction of k. If you introduce an effective mass tensor, if you introduce an effective mass tensor, then the energy will still be parabolic, but it will be no longer spherical. Because the warping, um, the, the, the curvature of the parabola will depend on the direction of k. That's, that means warping or non-spherical, but it is still parabolic. So the bands can be the bands can be parabolic but non-spherical. And if you think of the, do I have a good picture for this? No, um, yeah, if you think of this picture here, the, all these bands are parabolic, but they're not spherical because the curvature depends on direction. And that's why we say that this parabola is warped. Any other questions? If not, then uh, thank you very much, and I will be back here in two weeks.